Thank you, Thomas. And um, thank you all for listening uh, to me today. It's a real pleasure to be here on this uh, monumental day for, for Mark. And I guess together, this is in fact the day, right? So um, yeah, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here uh, to give this presentation. Um, so I'm going to uh, give a talk which uh, sort of spans uh, a work from really uh, the time when I first met Mark uh, through to the present uh, day. And uh, in no, you know, um, it's no underestimation for me to say on it, quite honestly, that I owe my career to Mark in, in, in ways that um, it's, I hope you'll be able to, to see. Uh, and, and I feel like Mark is influenced sort of everything I've done since I, I first met him. So uh, in terms of a background, so is this that will advance. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's uh, try some other means here. All right, so I first met Mark back in the mid 90s uh, when I was a graduate student at Princeton University. And um, Mark uh, had relatively recently published this paper with uh, Jim Murray uh, on modeling territory and wolf deer interactions. And um, Mark uh, came to Princeton in the mid 90s uh, on sabbatical. And I, it was something as a graduate student I was really excited about because um, it, uh, well, for a number of reasons. Uh, so as I mentioned, I was a graduate student in the graduate program at Princeton uh, in the Ecology and Evolution Department. And I think it's fair to say uh, that um, at that time, Princeton had a fairly laissez-faire approach to its graduate students in that um, most students were actually not working on projects. We had a committee and they advised us, but most people weren't working on something particularly close to an advisor. And um, so on my committee, I had um, Simon Levin, Steve Pocala, and Dan Rubenstein, who were providing me a lot of sort of general advice and, and insights on how to uh, work on what I was working on. But it was really when Mark came along that it sort of opened these new opportunities. And, and I feel like that role of chance in one's career really uh, played out in that way. So what had happened is I I'd, uh, done my thesis defense. I was uh, been to Yellowstone to study a coyote population and uh, basically, you know, uh, had been given the the go ahead to do a, a study looking at really uh, the uh, the patterns of um, space use and, and sort of uh, demography of the coyote population prior to the wolf reintroduction. But I, I came back from that um, uh, field uh, study. So I'd gone onto that study and it was very empirical based study and, and they kind of just viewed me as the modeler, right? Um, in that way that sort of empirical ecologists awfully do. It's like, you're the modeling guy. And so, and I was really kind of struggling for like, how am I actually gonna do this and, and use modeling to, to understand this population better. And then I read this part of my mark and it really kind of, kind of fired me up for a, a number of reasons. It, it really tapped into a whole sort of thing that I, I kind of learned from Simon and, and Steve Picard and others about the kind of interface between theory and empirical measurements in uh, ecology. Um, and I read this paper and, um, you know, I'd been sort of involved in the, in the coyote study and we've been collecting data, not unlike this kind of data, you know, this is old school radio telemetry, right, where we are triangulating the, the locations of animals. And I was sort of vaguely appalled uh, when I looked to the literature and basically was, bit, you know, the literature was telling me, well, to analyze that data, you should sort of draw a polygon around it and that is going to summarize what the coyotes home range. And after spending all this time watching coyotes moving around landscapes, that just felt like a crime to me, right? Because there's all this sort of rich data that you're collecting and all you're doing is essentially summarizing by putting a polygon around it. And when I read Mark's paper, I saw a window there into another way to analyze that kind of data. Uh, because in that paper, what uh, Mark and um, um, Jim Murray really uh, advanced was this uh, essentially, you know, uh, drawing from the classical literature on uh, spatial models in, in ecology, this uh, set of equations over here describing the patterns of space use of a pair of animals who are interacting through uh, conspecific avoidance mediated by ascent marks, right? And that these are the ordinary differential equations describing the, the dynamics of scent marking by the animals 
uh, and the avoidance responses uh, are, generate these taxes terms in those advection diffusion equations. Now at that time, you know, I was, you know, my background is in ecology. I'd taken Simon Levin's course, so I, I knew what a PDE was, right? I'd seen them, but I'd really never seen them sort of applied to something relevant to what I was working on. And so I got very excited about this. And when Mark came, we started uh, immediately working together. And as everybody's spoken, um, Mark's very naturally sort of collaborative uh, manner. And um, so we started to, to work together on, on that. And um, in essence, for me, right, the idea that we was, were thinking about uh, was this idea of modeling the movement process. That term does not come from me. That's actually from Maslow uh, several years later. But it's essentially it's the idea that the home ranges of the animals is this emergent property of arising from interactions, in this case, mediated by scent marks. And I was excited as an ecologist because I felt like this provided a framework for real kind of hypothesis testing, where you could posit different movement rules and ask, you know, um, what spatial patterns of relocation should we observe and how well do those observe uh, match the relocations. And it also offers, offers, offers these opportunities for prediction because you have an underlying dynamical model. And so when things are changing some way, you can make predictions about how patterns should uh, change. In other words, we're, you know, the, the previous kind of minimum convex polygon methods are really kind of descriptive statistics about a home range. And here, this is opportunity to do uh, prediction. So um, I spent a long time uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, working to produce uh, th this figure. This was the main sort of result that came actually out of my thesis, which was the application of the model that uh, Mark and, and uh, Jim had developed to not uh, the, work, the data from Yellowstone, but actually another set of data collected by our collaborator, Bob Crabtree, who'd worked earlier in the Hanford uh, Arid Lands Reserve in Washington, where we'd taken that one-dimensional model and applied it in two dimensions to a, you know, a, a, rather than a pairwise interaction, a multi-pack interaction. And uh, we were able to show that that model characterized quite well the patterns of space use that one can find uh, in the arid land reserves. Uh, in particular, you know, you captured the, that, that group in the middle, the pattern of space use really quite well um, because you've got all of the neighbors uh, surrounding that pack. And uh, I definitely, um, um, Bob also, you know, uh, deserves a huge amount of credit for collecting that, that marvelous data set back then using radio uh, telemetry uh, techniques. So um, that was in 99. Um, and we basically, we, we've said, well, well you know, we, we can say that the pattern of coyote home ranges at Hanford, you can account for in terms of this conspecific avoidance. And we tested against some sort of null models to show that, that you know, statistically, it's a, a much better fit than a, a, a kind of a, a simpler mechanistic type model. Um, so um, for me, that, that was uh, sort of the big sort of first result that we had uh, together. And um, all I can say is that, you know, Mark was the person who enabled me to do that because like I say, I knew nothing about PDEs, but Mark taught me about how to analyze PDEs, how to implement them uh, and, and uh, uh, conduct numerical simulations. And then we then sort of moved ahead and started applying that uh, to other situations like that in Yellowstone. So this shows the fit of the original model to the Yellowstone data, um, which was my original thesis uh, project study. And um, as you can see here, that model does not describe the patterns uh, that well. You've got the segregation of the packs in some way, but you haven't captured the sort of uh, the concentration of the animals on the valley floor there in Yellowstone. But what we were able to show, and this was seven years later, admittedly, uh, was that it didn't take much to sort of add just some additional realism into that model about uh, incorporating responses to resources. And in particular, the case of the coyotes is the fact that they forage for small mammals uh, down in the riparian areas. And when you add in that response to prey availability, which is shown here by the, the symbol H of X, um, that you've incorporated that into the movement model, um, you, you can actually capture the pattern of uh, space use in, in Yellowstone quite well. 
and there were some comments yesterday about the role of you know, spatial heterogeneity and, and environmental heterogeneity and sort of complicating things. And it, it does complicate them a little, but um, I felt like the, the, the jump to, to fitting this model, um, it, it, you know, when you do the non-dimensionalization and everything else, it adds one extra parameter to the fitting. Um, but we, we could characterize the, the pattern quite well because we've got both the imprint of the environment and the responses of the animals to that, but we also have the um, sort of socially mediated uh, interactions between the groups arising from their uh, scent marks. So, uh, and, and sort of in essence, right, we could conclude in the case of Yellowstone that we can account for that using essentially a fairly uh, straightforward, I would say, modification of the original Lewis and Murray model by incorporating uh, responses to uh, prey availability, which in this case is literally measured in terms of the density uh, in kilograms per hectare of, of small mammals in the environment. Okay, so um, we, we did have an opportunity in the case of Yellowstone to do, uh, and at least illustrate that concept of doing prediction in that um, what happened uh, during the, the study period where was the, there was the, the breakup of one of the packs, the Norris uh, pack, which is shown dotted here. And uh, basically when you, if you fit the model and then take away the pack in, in, in the, the fitted model, you know, the neighboring uh, groups essentially move into that home range and start occupying and, and, and focusing their attention on the high resource areas um, down on the valley floor that that pack was exploiting. And there's actually data to show that's indeed what happened. Now, uh, you know, a, a um, sort of died in the wall sort of uh, animal ecologist would say, oh, gee, well, that's not that surprising that the animals would exploit this under, now underlying utilized resource. But the ability to sort of make a real spatial pattern prediction about exactly how much the home ranges would shift and everything, I think, was our, what we felt like was the, the, the novel contribution of that. So, uh, and then, you know, Mark and I then ended up writing a book together, which, uh, again, like, it was sort of a chance thing. We were thinking about a longer paper, and then there was an opportunity to actually uh, write a monograph for this uh, Princeton series, uh, Monographs in Population Biology. And so that turned into a sort of, well, I guess a decade long effort, right? It, it took a while. I mean, by that time, I'd been doing a postdoc working on other things uh, and then become an assistant professor hired to do other things, mostly to work on models of vegetation. Um, but we sort of, we kept out working on the book um, because, you know, Mark had been such a great uh, collaborator and uh, I felt like, um, it, it, you know, that really continued over the years as we put those uh, chapters together. And I, I don't know how you feel, Mark, but I feel like writing a book is not the same as writing a, 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 the same amount of individual papers in that the way that you end up having to link them, I think is um, something that I think ecology is starting to lose a little bit, you know, in the, in the way that the you know, we've all sort of, uh, all of us who are older in the room have seen this switch from, you know, well, really the development of what I would call the kind of publication rat race that, that uh, has, has uh, really come about because of uh, modern technologies. Um, and, uh, there, you know, there are advantages to that, but there are also real downsides. And um, my wife is in the humanities and they, all they do is write books. And, you know, seeing the contrast in the, the, those two different intellectual fields, I think, is uh, quite uh, start, uh, shocking. And I think we really need to kind of learn from each other about that. And, and that there, are, there should be venues to write longer papers and things uh, these days, despite the pressure to kind of publish, publish, publish. Okay, so um, I'm now going to fast forward uh, to work on memory-based uh, movement models. And uh, for me, this came about, um, you know, uh, in that when I started to present on the work that Mark and I had done together, I remember a very a poignant comment, actually, that, that John Frixel made um, at, at a meeting where I presented the, the model, and he, and he was, uh, you know, he said, this is really, it's, he has a very positive remark, said, yes, this is really interesting work, but it's not a home range model. And um, what he meant by that is that the model that Mark and I had worked on 
the sort of details of the biology were very specific to the sort of situation of carnivores like wolves and like uh, coyotes where um, uh, really the interactions between the groups are, are socially mediated. And John's point was that there are a lot of animals that have home ranges which don't sort of follow those conventions. And so what that uh, led to was really a spurring of interest in the, the way in which uh, home ranges might form in other kinds of animals uh, like uh, deer and many other ungulates that John and others have studied. And in particular, the role that memory might play in home range formation. And so uh, there have been a whole sort of series of papers about that. Um, the paper over the top was by Bram van Motter in 2009, which um, sort of, I think, brought the sort of ideas from statistical physics actually into e ecology. Um, but then a whole series of papers by Mark and many of people in uh, Mark's group, some of whom are in, in this room, like uh, the work that Jonathan uh, did, uh, the work that Tal Avgar did, and also the work that Jared Merkel did. Um, uh, but in particular, I highlighted here the, the paper that uh, Mark wrote with uh, Ulrika Schlegel, who was a, a graduate student with Mark, um, in which uh, they started to incorporate a memory into movement models and combine them with uh, ideas about resource uh, attraction. And you know, in the case of Mark, uh, this is uh, just a, a much more recent paper, 2021 paper that uh, Mark wrote with Bill Fagan uh, on, on that and others on the uh, topic. And indeed, uh, Mark was also the second author on a, a very influential paper by Bill Fagan about the roles of um, memory in uh, animal movement patterns. Sure, so, um, so what we've done is to um, develop models uh, to which incorporate a lot of these ideas of um, essentially modeling uh, resources and then incorporating the effects of memory. And so uh, this is a very simple model that uh, uh, I've worked on with uh, Nathan Rank and uh, Francesca Cagnacci, uh, in which you are modeling uh, responses to resources, but we're incorporating the effects of memory uh, through some simple memory dynamic. And then we're fitting these models directly to uh, the, the kinds of data which come from GPS telemetry studies in which you have individual level uh, movements. So we've applied this in uh, this uh, setting here, which is a study that Francesca Cagnacci was involved in. It's a reintroduction of a deer into uh, a national park in Italy, and we can fit the model to the individual uh, locations. And um, what we've, uh, been able to, to do is sort of uh, tease out the, the effects of memory and resources in this situation, which uh, the situation of introductions is a really nice one because it's one of the challenges of, uh, of looking at memory is the, the role that initialization plays, is that we don't have, in most cases, a, an estimate of what the initial memory of the animals are, but when you have an introduction, you can kind of quite rightly assume that the animals really don't know anything about that environment. And so you kind of see the dynamic of how resource preferences and memory interact as the animals move around that novel landscape. And what we've been able to show is that essentially uh, a, a model in which you incorporate memory, those are the ones uh, shown in blue, so the memory plus resources, essentially that you can fit, they fit the data much better in terms of the uh, patterns of step length distributions and everything else. You get predictions for patterns of previously visited relocations. And then we can look at emergent patterns like at patterns of revisitation and show that when you incorporate memory, you capture the pattern of revisitation uh, defined here in terms of number of visits or time since last visits uh, much, much uh, more realistically. Um, you also uh, modulate the estimates of how the animals uh, respond to resources in, in essence because it's teasing out the sort of memory component of uh, response to the environment uh, from the, the sort of intrinsic response to the, the underlying resources. So um, we in this, these situations, we can make predictions about the, the patterns of movement and what they look like. And uh, here are the observations in the middle, and this is just uh, example simulations for a series of the deer. And what it's showing, in essence, is the patterns of movement, if you simulate the movement process, look a lot more like the observations than the simpler models that don't incorporate uh, memory. And what that um, 
that then can do is look at emergent patterns of, of, of net squared displacement as another metric of sort of the ability of those models to more realistically capture the observed patterns of movement. So um, that's really uh, the end of my talk. Um, there are a few summary comments uh, here uh, about um, th the role that memory plays, but I wanna really end with a few more words about Mark and uh, really to say happy birthday, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, you've been an amazing collaborator on so many levels um, uh, as, as a mentor, as a colleague, and as a friend. And I, you know, we're here in Canada at the Fields Institute, and I'd like to say two other things, is that in many ways you embody two great things about the applied math community and about Canadians. And I feel like I can say this because I'm now married to a Canadian and I'm spending more time here, in that uh, you embody the sort of the best values of both Canada and applied mathematics. And I, I think, um, I, I really mean that, <laughs> yeah. So that's it. <laughs>